touch. What's the fourth dimension? Well, Einstein said the fourth dimension is time. So if you want to meet somebody in Times Square, you say, meet me on 42nd Street, 5th Avenue, 10th floor at noontime. So it takes four numbers to specify lunch in Manhattan. But we now believe there could be other dimensions, perhaps as many as 11 dimensions. And we hope to test these ideas with the Large Hadron Collider. Is there an LHC type device here in the States? We once had dreams of building a super collider outside Dallas, Texas. It was to be much bigger, about three times bigger than the puny pea shooter in Geneva, Switzerland. On the last day of hearing, a congressman asked a physicist, quote, will we find God with your machine? If so, I will vote for it. Well, the poor physicist didn't know what to say. So he said, we'll find the Higgs boson. Well, the vote was taken the next day, and people were saying, $11 billion for another god darn subatomic particle. And they took a vote, and it was canceled. Now, since then, we physicists have been mulling that question over and over in our minds. How should we have answered that question? Will we find God with your machine? If so, I will vote for it. I would have said the following. I would have said God by whatever signs or symbols you ascribe to the deity. This machine will take us as close as humanly possible to his or her greatest creation, Genesis. This is a Genesis machine. It will recreate on a small scale the most glorious event in the history of the universe, its birth. Unfortunately, we said Higgs boson and our machine was canceled. $11 billion out the window, and now the Vatican of Physics is not Dallas, Texas. The Vatican of Physics is Geneva, Switzerland. There's a brain drain. My friends, some of my friends are leaving the United States to go to the new Vatican of Physics, Geneva, in part because our politicians thought it was a waste of time to fund science. What about the Fermilab um, operation in Chicago? That machine is old. Eventually, it'll be shut down. Uh, it is the second largest machine, but the Large Hadron Collider today is, is way beyond the Fermilab. So the Fermilab will eventually become probably a museum of sorts uh, because it's not at the cutting edge. And th there's a lesson here, and that is there's a price you pay for being on the cutting edge of science. The benefits are enormous. The industrial age, the steam engine, transistors, lasers, space satellites. Those are the benefits of being on the cutting edge. The downside is, if you're not on the cutting edge, somebody else will be on the cutting edge and leave you in the dust. So that's the lesson. The cancellation of our super collider has created the new Vatican of physics, Geneva, Switzerland. Do you believe in a god? I would believe in the god of Einstein. Einstein was asked this question many times. And he said, look, there are two kinds of god. So let's be clear about this. The first God is the personal God, the God that answers prayers, the God of Isaac, Moses, Jacob, the God that parts, uh, parts the, the sea and walks on water, the God that answers prayers, the personal God. Einstein said that, no, he believed in this other God, the God of Spinoza and Leibniz, the God of reason, the God of beauty, elegance, simplicity, that it's amazing that the laws of science are very simple, very elegant, very mathematical, and it couldn't have been an accident. He thought, he said to himself that, look, we are like children entering this huge library, this cavernous library. All we can do is take the first book, open up and read the first page of this first book of this cavernous library. And so he said that he believed in, in the God of order, the God of simplicity and harmony. And in hyperspace, you write, when scientists use the word God, they usually mean the God of order. However, to the non-scientists, the word God almost universally refers to the God of miracles. And this is a source of miscommunication between scientists and non-scientists. Why are theologians opposed or concerned about string theory? Every time a new radical discovery comes out of quantum mechanics and atomic physics, the theologians come and start to debate us. Uh, when the uncertainty principle came out, for example, in around 1925, 
and we said that there's uncertainty in the world. Newtonian physics is overthrown. The theologians came back at us and said, what about free will? I mean, are we deterministic? Is there a book in heaven that says, you will go to hell, you will go to heaven? Or is there uncertainty in the world? Now we realize that there could be other dimensions, a multiverse of universes. Uh, just realize that uh, 400 years ago, the Catholic Church burned alive Giordano Bruno, a renegade Jesuit monk, who said that there are other life forms in outer space. For that, he was burned alive in the streets of Rome. Now we're saying that not only could there be other life forms in outer space, we're talking about a multiverse of universes. Our universe could be just one bubble floating among other bubbles out there. And Stephen Hawking, my colleague, made headlines just last month by stating that maybe God isn't necessary anymore. Here's uh, Stephen Hawking's reasoning. He says, first of all, that physicists are the only scientists who can say the word God and not blush. But if you want to see a physicist blush, ask him what happened before the Big Bang. Well, string theory is a theory of everything. If it's correct, it means you can go before the Big Bang, before creation itself. Maybe our bubble universe bumped into another universe, creating a bigger universe. Maybe it butted off, fission, peeled off a balloon that simply splits in half. Maybe that's the Big Bang. And then Stephen Hawking said, well, if this is perpetual and we don't need a God to set it into motion, then maybe God is unnecessary. Now, I take a different point of view on this question. I would say, well, yeah, maybe God is not necessary to create a Big Bang. But then, who created string theory? Where did the theory come from? Where did the mathematics come from? And at that point, physicists stop. Okay? So we can go before the Big Bang. We're not embarrassed about that anymore. But then the question is, where did the law come from? Who is the law giver? God is supposed to be the law giver. If the law is string theory, where did that theory come from? And I think even Stephen Hawking would say, I don't know. Michio Kaku is our guest on In-Depth. Here is a list of his books. Beginning in 1995, Beyond Einstein, The Cosmic Quest for the Theory of the Universe. Then also in 1995, Hyperspace, A Scientific Odyssey Through Parallel Universes, Time Warps, and the Tenth Dimension. Visions came out in 1999, How Science Will Revolutionize the 21st Century and Beyond. And in 2005, Einstein's Cosmos, How Albert Einstein's Vision Transformed Our Understanding of Space and Time. 2006 brought us Parallel Worlds, A Journey Through Creation, Higher Dimensions, and the Future of the Cosmos. And in 2008, Dr. Kaku's most recent book, Physics of the Impossible, a scientific exploration into the world of phasers, force fields, teleportation, and time travel. Dr. Kaku, in reading your books, you make many, many references to popular culture, Star Trek, Back to the Future, uh, uh, Isaac Asimov. Why? It goes back to my childhood. When I was eight years old, everyone was talking about the fact that a great scientist had just died. And they showed a picture of his desk with his book, Unfinished Manuscript. And to me, this was incredible. How could the greatest scientist of our time not finish this problem? Well, it was Einstein's unified field theory. But at that time, I also was doing something else. I was watching television. Every Saturday morning, I watched the Flash Gordon series on TV with Buster Crab. I mean, I was floored. For the first time, I saw evidence of alien civilization, starships, ray guns, city in the sky, anti-gravity, all the things that I never even thought of before. And then I began to realize something. I began to realize, first of all, I didn't have muscles and blonde hair. I wasn't an Olympic swimmer like Buster Crab. But it was the scientist who made everything work. So it was Dr. Zarkov with his starship, with his city in the sky, with his ray guns. Without science, there's no Flash Gordon. And so I said to myself, well, these are two passions of my life. One is to understand physics. The other is to understand the future and science fiction. Maybe they are actually the same thing. The two passions of my life are really the same because to understand time travel, to understand 
get dimensional gateways, to understand antimatter, the fourth dimension, you need the most advanced physics there is, which is string theory. And so I thought to myself, wow, I can merge the two great loves of my life. So I'll admit it, I'm a Trekkie. I watched all the Star Trek movies, all the Star Wars movies. I love this stuff, okay, because it forces you to open your imagination. Now, to be fair, sometimes I kind of like grit my teeth watching these science fiction movies because I say to myself, well, that's not right. No, no, that's not right. No, that's wrong. That's not right. But then I say to myself, hey, relax. Enjoy the show. Go with the flow and have some fun. Uh, you host radio science shows, and you also host a show on the Science Fiction Channel. Uh, science Channel, that's right. Science it's Channel. called Sci-Fi Science. It's one of the highest rated shows on, on the Science Channel. Um, first season, 12 episodes about starships and building a time machine and going to another dimension. Second season we're in right now, every Wednesday night, another 12 episodes, making contact with alien civilizations in outer space, how to deflect meteors, what happens when robots become super powerful. These are all subjects that we take in the second season. And, you know, some people ask me, well, why do this? And one thing is that I get to interview the world's top scientists in all these fields. So altogether, I've interviewed about 300 of the world's top scientists. So when I talk to them about the future, it's just not some science fiction writer just BSing about what he thinks the future is going to be. I'm talking to the scientists who are inventing the future in their laboratories. I have a front row seat to be able to get on the telephone, talk to Nobel laureates, directors of the major laboratories, and say, what is your dream? What do you think 2050, 2100 is going to look like? And to me, that, to me, that's a thrill of a lifetime. Because instead of speculating, instead of moaning and groaning about when we're going to have flying cars, I can talk to the people who are inventing the future. Well, in parallel worlds, you discuss time travel. Is it possible? It could very well be possible. Uh, Stephen Hawking has said that, yes, time travel is possible, but not practical. In other words, don't expect an inventor to create a time machine in their basement today. We're talking about the energy of a star, the energy of a black hole. But in principle, if you could master that energy, then you might be able to bend time into a pretzel. The mathematics says so. Even Albert Einstein realized in 1949, his own equations allow you to go backwards in time. If the universe rotated, for example, a very simple kind of universe, a rotating universe, and you go with the flow, you go around the universe as it rotates, you can come back into the past. So simply walking around a circle, you come back not where you left, but you come back yesterday. So even Einstein realized, oh my God, his own equations allow for time travel. So in his memoirs, of course, Einstein had to address the question, is time travel possible? And he said, aha, I have found a loophole. And that is, the universe expands. It doesn't rotate. So it means that if the universe rotated, time travel would become commonplace. So thank goodness the universe expands. Well, we have this email in for you that mm -hmm. kind of fits into what you were just talking about. Very simple. How did the cosmos begin and how will it end? Well, we think the universe began with a cosmic explosion 13.7 um, billion years ago. We know that number to within 1% accuracy. In well, fact. How do we know that? Well, we know the rate at which the universe is expanding. Uh, stars, for example, yellow light from stars is stretched because they're moving away from us, and they turn reddish as a consequence. That's called a Doppler shift. When a car moves toward you, for example, uh, the frequency is high. When a car moves away from you, the frequency is stretched or lowered. It sounds like this. E -e -e. Now, you've heard that all your life. But what is that? That's a Doppler effect. It also works for light beams. When yellow light comes toward you, it's bluish. When yellow light moves away from you, it's reddish. The redder it is, the faster it moves. So it's trivial to calculate the expansion of the universe. You simply look at the night sky and see how much the, the, the light is red shifted. Then you run the videotape backwards. We have this enormous, quote, videotape on computer of the expanding universe, so we run it backwards. You've all seen explosions from a super collider outside Dallas, Texas. 
It was to be much bigger, about three times bigger than the puny pea shooter in Geneva, Switzerland. On the last day of hearing, a congressman asked a physicist, quote, will we find God with your machine? If so, since then, we physicists have been mulling that question over and over in our minds. How should we have answered that question? Will we find God with your machine? If so, I will vote for it. I would have said the following. I would have said, God, by whatever, I will vote for it. Well, the poor physicist didn't know what to say. So he said, we'll find the Higgs boson. Well, the vote was taken the next day, and people were saying, $11 billion for another god darn subatomic particle. And they took a vote, and it was canceled. Now, since touch. What's the fourth dimension? Well, Einstein says the fourth dimension is time. So if you want to meet somebody in Times Square, you say, meet me on 42nd Street, 5th Avenue, 10th floor at noontime. So it takes four numbers to specify lunch in Manhattan. But we now believe there could be other dimensions, perhaps as many as 11 dimensions. And we hope to test these ideas with the Large Hadron Collider. Is there an LHC type device here in the States? We once had dreams of building 